Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is proving to be a very interesting one on how to interpret Scripture. This is lesson number three in that series for April 18 of 2020, entitled, Jesus and the Apostles' View of the Bible. Uh, that'll be interesting to study. As, as usual, we like to begin with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, we come with our ideas of how to understand Scripture and principles that many of us have been taught since we were small children. Um, help us to understand exactly what role Scripture should play in our thinking and how we can use it when talking to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We live in what some people have chosen to call the postmodern age. I don't know how you get past modern, but the <laughs> postmodern age. And we know that the world has largely rejected Scripture in favor of certain philosophical ideas that question the inspiration and authority of the Bible. Skeptics believe the Bible is just a collection of merely human ideas. They believe that people who lived in a primitive culture long ago could not possibly understand reality as we do today or contribute in a positive way to our worldview. So, throw it in the trash heap, right? The idea that the Bible might have some supernatural basis is rejected out of hand. Instead of the Bible being God's view of humanity, it is thought of as humanity's view of God. Thus, and you think about that implication, uh, that's very interesting. Thus, many regard the Bible as irrelevant in a time of modern philosophy and especially Darwinian thinking. Seventh-day Adventists, of course, reject that position out of hand also. We see God's hand all the way through Scripture. In this lesson, we will see how Jesus himself the living Son of God and the Apostles understood the Old Testament, which was about the people, places, uh, which was the Bible that they had available to them at that time. I'm sorry. They, did they speak about the people and places described in the Old Testament as if they were true representations? Mm -hmm. Would it be safer to follow the example of Jesus and the Apostles rather than some modern philosophical ideas? Well, there's a... A question we should think about? In a single word, yes. 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 <laughs> okay, that's simple enough. There are some interesting verses that help us to, to guide us a little bit in, in, in approaching this. Look at the example of Jesus. That's going to be the first person we're going to look at. And I'm going to start not where the Bible study guide does, but two verses earlier. They do mention these verses just briefly. I'm going to start with Matthew 3, verse 16. As Jesus is coming up out of the water from being baptized, he, he, uh, the heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and alighting on him. Then a voice said from heaven, This is my own dear Son, with whom I am pleased. So let's think about that for a moment. Jesus has grown up in a village known as Nazareth, which was not known as a good place to live. Uh, he has gone down. He got baptized by John. He has not yet been out to the wilderness for the temptations. And he comes up out of the water and hears this experience. All three members of the Godhead are there. The yeah. Spirit comes down. The Father speaks. Jesus is there. Yeah. Of course, then, God is everywhere all the time, isn't he? Yeah, but he doesn't always make himself manifest. So that's it. He, God made himself manifest in all three right. forms. Well, his awareness extends everywhere. Yeah. So I could say I'm in this room, but my physical mass does not inhabit every inch of this space. But to the mm -hmm. extent that I'm aware of what's going on, I can say I'm, I'm present yeah. in this room. And so God... Could, could be present everywhere because his awareness extends everywhere. Well, as you probably know, um, if you've studied the Bible very much and talked to people who do it, study it, there were no chapter divisions and there were no verse divisions in the original. It just went right straight on. So I'm now moving into chapter 4, but there should be no break. Mm 
Then the Spirit led Jesus into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now, there's several interesting things we're going to see here in the book of Matthew that uh, people question, and this is one of them. Would the, de would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus up to be tempted by the devil? Does that sound right? No. We'll get to that in a moment. After spending 40 days and nights without food, Jesus was hungry. <coughs> then the devil came to him and said, If you are God's son, order these stones to turn into bread. And you know the rest of the sequence there. So in the original documents of the Bible, there were no separations between chapters and verses. We've already mentioned that. At his baptism, Jesus came up out of the water, looked up, saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove, and heard his Father say, This is my own Son with whom I am pleased. At that moment in time, all three members of the Godhead were present or, as Dennis has suggested, made themselves apparent, um, affirming the divine mission of Jesus. And then the story goes on to recall the attempts by Satan and notice <coughs> specifically what Satan is trying to counteract. I mean, he must have been very upset when God showed up and made that statement and so forth uh, at, at, at the baptism there. So what does Satan want to question? The reality of, of, of Jesus and who he is, yeah. to cause Jesus to give up on his mission, and three, to cause him to doubt his identity. And those three temptations were really, really designed intentionally to try to attack one or the other of those three issues with Jesus. Question. Mm -hmm. The people gathered around at that baptism. Don't you wonder what they heard? Did they hear that in their own language mm -hmm. and understand it? Did they see a dove? We, Jesus heard yeah. it. Ellen White says no. She, I think she says they heard something, but they didn't know what it was talking about. I think uh, the John the Baptist understood. Yes, it. because he had. Been, he says later, and it might be in another. Uh, yeah, Luke. Yeah, that uh, I was told that the one on whom this uh, spirit rests is is the one, and he attests that he indeed he, yeah. saw that. So now Jesus, of course. His life, many details of his life were prophesied from the Old Testament. So he picks out some words from the Old Testament and always it is, it is written. We, do, we need to remember that these words that Jesus quoted from the Old Testament were actually his own words given to Moses and recorded in Deuteronomy 1400 years earlier. These words were a portion of the final instructions given by Moses to the children of Israel before they entered the land of Canaan. You remember the book of Deuteronomy is mainly consists of three, they're not really sermons, they were you know, presentations that Moses made. Okay, this is what you should do. This is what's going to happen, da-da-da-da. Three major presentations make up the book of Deuteronomy, and this was a part of one of those. And, of course, we know that after these three temptations, finally Jesus said what? As we would have said as kids, get lost. Yeah. Right? Get behind me. Yeah. yeah. Go away, Satan. So how should we respond to Satan's temptations in our day? Well, none of us have grown up with somebody predicting our lives in the Old Testament. So does that mean we can't predict, we can't use the Old Testament to Support what God wants us to do. We can use the old and the new. We can use the old and the new. Yeah. Have you ever uh, committed a significant portion of Scripture to memory? Well, not for well, a long time. Some. I mean, different Psalms and, yeah, and like JMVs. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I and, did all that. Yeah. When I was in high school or academy and college. Um, at different times, I decided I would memorize a significant portion of Scripture. I memorized the book of James. And then when I was in college, I memorized the entire book of Romans. Wow. So that's quite a... Can you still say it without looking? No, I need to go back and refresh right. up my memory a little bit. But if, if I run across something somewhere in, in a different version, because I, I memorized it actually out of good speed. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I run across it, oh yeah, I know where that is. So, I was going to say, I assumed it was the King James Version that you learned. Nope. Good speed. Not huh? the King James. Really? 
Yeah. I learned James is, was King James. Uh -huh. I learned that, and uh, I, my mother, when she found out I had learned that, asked me to get up and recite it in front of a, I think it was a WCTU, Women's Christian Temperance Organization meeting that she went to regularly, and the women were amazed that a high school student in those days would memorize scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, it's important for us to notice that Jesus didn't wait. In fact, this is demonstrated in several places in Scripture. He, would, he did not waste a moment arguing with Satan on some philosophical basis or whatever. He just says, that's it. Scripture, it is written. He didn't respond in anger. He didn't say, hey, I had a fight with you in heaven. Get lost. You lost. You know, none of that kind of stuff. He just says, it is written, yeah. Well, there are a number of passages in Matthew, for example, Matthew 5, 17 to 20, and 22, 29, and 23, 2 and 3, that we probably should look at briefly. Those are short. Do not think that I have come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with not until the end of all things. So then whoever disobeys even the least important of the commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least in the kingdom of heaven. On the other hand, whoever obeys the law and teaches others to do the same will be great in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you're more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. And can you imagine, we have a wonderful pastor here, but can you imagine... Someone showing up at a large Seventh-day Adventist meeting where there's a lot of church authorities there and say, unless you're more righteous than all these people, you're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not fair for me to compare uh, our church leaders with scribes and Pharisees, but that was, that was the way they looked at them. You know, these were the spiritual leaders, supposedly. We'll look at Matthew twenty-two, twenty-nine. 29. Jesus answered them, How wrong you are. It is because you don't know the Scripture or God's power. And then chapter 23, 22, uh, 2 and 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. So you must obey and follow everything they tell you to do. That would be from the law. Do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. Wow. So later in his ministry, Jesus repeated addresses the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, repeatedly addressed the scribes, Pharisees and Sadducees, telling the people to accept what they teach from Scripture, but not to follow their example. By these words, he implied that they did not really understand the Old Testament Scriptures. Imagine what a shock it must have been to those authorities and even to the other Jewish people to hear Jesus say those words. I'm sure they would have been very happy to, extract, to grab him and put him in prison if they could have gotten away with it at that point. But it's important to notice that in all of that, Jesus did not imply any doubt of any kind about the reality of the Old Testament scriptures. At one point, this is something that we're all very familiar with, I'm sure, a, a person known as a teacher of the law tried to trap Jesus with the question, which is the most important commandment? Now, why do you suppose he asked that? Because it was a debate among the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's right. They had big arguments, lengthy <laughs> arguments about this. And what does Jesus do? It is written. Yeah. Two passages, Leviticus 18, uh, 19, 18 and Deuteronomy 6, 5. Just plain and simple. First great commandment is to love God and the last, uh, second commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. And of course, the good news for us is that that first commandment summarizes the first four of the Ten Commandments, and the other one summarizes the last six of the Ten Commandments. I've always looked at the commandments as telling us how to do it. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the summary of the commandments, and the commandments, they tell us how. They give us instructions on how. Yeah. Actually, what we call the Ten Commandments, is, another way to call it is a prescription. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also a description of the way intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Rather than a command. 
No. And you're free to not to either to listen and take instruction or free to go your own yeah. self-destructive way. Yeah. Well, many modern Christians, people who call themselves believers, have largely thrown out the Old Testament as being antiquated, not relevant to their lives. They believe that their gospel is found exclusively in the New Testament. When, when, when questioned about that very issue, Christ quoted directly from the Old Testament. And here's Ellen White's comments about that in Christ's Obdue Lessons 39 and 40. He, that is Christ, pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority. And we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversies, and the foundation of of all faith. Wow, that's a pretty comprehensive statement, huh? If we have before us all of Scripture, plus these clear testimonies from Jesus himself about the reliability of Scripture, what other competitive source of authority could we possibly quote that would overrule his example? I mean, if you stopped and asked, let's see, which is more authoritative? I mean, if you're a Christian believer, do I believe the Bible or do I believe what somebody just told me? You know, it would seem logic. I mean, you, you, you good, faithful Seventh-day Adventists, we would just admit, oh, now what we do in actual practice is another story, but at least if you stop and think about it, we, oh, yeah, we want to follow the Bible. Yeah. So are there some philosophical considerations that outweigh the authority of Scripture? Maybe cultural issues or teaching from some honored professor or pastor? No. Should we take what you say or what a pastor yeah. says? Yeah, please don't take Or what should I say. we go back to the Bible? Well, if, if it does not agree with the Bible, we need to reject it. That's yes. right. Yeah. Well, we should examine things, but uh, uh, all things and hold fast to that which is good. Sometimes what we understand in scripture may can be wrong though we can have a misunderstanding as oh, the yes. disciple as the, the disciples uh, disciples and the jewish rulers and all of them had misunderstanding so when something comes up uh it if we completely shut it down as we will study next week uh maybe what about proverbs 31 take the wine it's going to be, don't give wine to the poor so they can forget their misery and remember their poverty no more. I'm to, it's in the book. Just, just to give you an idea of how powerful preconceived ideas can be, look at Luke 18, starting with verse 31. This is a story of Jesus. He is on his final journey up to that last Passover when he, of course, ultimately was arrested and crucified. They've, they're walking up from Jericho to Jerusalem. And that passage, that little narrow road where the Good Samaritan did his thing. And Jesus, he, he's with a huge crowd of people. And what are they thinking? They're absolutely certain. They're, they're so excited because they are sure that they are escorting Jesus to Jerusalem to be, anointed, to be chosen as king, okay. to be anointed as king. And in the middle of that, Look at these verses. Jesus took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, Listen, we are going to Jerusalem, where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. And they, they could have said, Oh yeah, we know, you're going to be the king. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. And, of course, they said, oh, no, please don't let that happen. No, what it says is, but the disciples did not understand any of these yeah. things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Fortunately, though, someone, one of the disciples remembered this and recorded transmitted it to it Luke, to Luke yeah. who recorded it for us. Yeah, fortunately. So this just goes to show us, all of us, and out, you out there too, you may be geniuses out there, but just be careful because if you have a strong preconceived opinion about something, you might hear something that disagrees with that and it just goes... Whoosh. Yeah, doesn't stick. Even after his death and resurrection, Christ still pointed to the scriptures 
as the authority that we should follow. And I love this story of the walk to Maus. So I, I wish we had time to read the whole thing. I, I like this thing when Jesus appears to them. I'm just going to read two or three of my favorite verses here. Jesus suddenly appears. He said to them, what are you talking about to each other as you walk along? Where are you reading from? I'm, read from, I'm reading from Luke 24, and it's verse 17. They stood still with sad faces. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor? <laughs> I have to chuckle every time I read. Are you the only visitor of Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have been happening there these last few days? What things? <laughs> yes. what things? You know, God has a fabulous sense of humor. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet, da, 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 and you know the rest of the story. Amazing. Just amazing. Um, Imagine God himself having moved beyond his human history, hiding his identity as he talked with, his extended, with one or a couple of his extended group of disciples. So instead of just rejoicing that he was alive, if he, if he had revealed himself, what do you think would have happened? They would have shouted. They would have turned back to Jerusalem. They would not have heard a word he had to say. Yeah, that's right. So instead of just rejoicing that he was alive, they would, not listen, to, they would listen to his words burning within them and recognize that oh, be, instead of that, they, one, two, they learned the Old Testament clearly prophesied what is in the New Testament, and two, the life of Jesus, his sufferings and his death were all the fulfillment of so many prophecies in the Old Testament. Someday, I want to hear that conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear exactly what he quoted from the Old Testament. Maybe even some books that we don't have anymore. It's important to notice in Luke 24, verse 27 and 44, part of those two parts of that story, that Jesus referred to all the scriptures and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. In this passage, Jesus was basically referring to all of what we call the Old Testament. From the writing of Moses to the very end of the Old Testament should be regarded as the word of God and if we believe Jesus, absolutely authoritative. The Word of God made flesh. We know about John 1, 1 to 3 and verse 14. Relied on the authority of Scripture to explain so many things in his life. And what did Jesus tell us to do? I'm going to halt there for just a second. Do you think he had any memory of the words he spoke in the Old Testament? Did. I'm sure he'd heard them or read them many yes. times, yes. but somehow I don't think that he remembered that he was the one that first spoke them. Mm -hmm. But what do I know? <laughs> Maybe eventually he did remember? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, here's what I believe, and I think I have pretty good evidence for this. I think every night, and maybe early in the morning also, he went over with his father exactly what was going to happen the next day. And he knew he was prepared for what was going to happen. He knew about it. So he may not have recognized in his own memory, but I, I'm sure the father would have said to him, remember you said this and this and this and this, and this is, what, this is the context and so forth. Okay. And we could have that relationship with God yeah. too. Matthew 28. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Wow. So we have seen that Jesus repeatedly quoted from the Old Testament, stated plainly that he accepted all of the Old Testament scriptures. What possible reason could we give for rejecting, rejecting even a portion of them? Jesus not only quoted scripture from the Old Testament to sustain his arguments, but also he used those words of the Old Testament, referring to them as the Word of God. The word of God. Matthew 19, four, verses 4 and 5, Jesus answered, 
Haven't you read the scripture that says, In the beginning the Creator made people male and female? And God said, For this reason a man will leave his father and his mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. It's from the Good News Bible. Now I want you to think about this for a moment in light of what we just said about how, whether or not Jesus knew about things. What if he had said to that group of people, Haven't you read the scriptures that I spoke to Moses in the beginning? I created the male and the female. And I said, for this reason, a man, because he could have. Yeah. His life would have ended much sooner. <laughs> Possibly. It's interesting. Well, apparently he read the scriptures. Mm hmm Yeah. And he knew what they said. Ken, did, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many stories in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament, but there's so many gory stories. How did... Christ, did he quote those? I mean... Elisha and the she-bears. Yeah. Uh, the concubine. The, all the wars and all the... The, yeah. the Levite and his concubine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's an awful story. It's an awful story. Yeah. So, you know, many people look at that and go, you know, the Old Testament is just... The stories are just... How, oh, could, uh, how could they be if, true? Okay, hold on just a minute. What if God were to write another book of the Bible now and try to include everything, I mean, a, a sampling from everything that's going on in the world today? Can you imagine what it would be like? Yeah. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean God endorsed something to be there. or, yeah. or it, It's a record of history. It shows how, how deprav the depravity... <laughs> may, we probably haven't seen the, the limits of depravity, but it, we've seen an awful lot of it. And... Yeah. You know, just because it's there doesn't mean God is a, the author of it. Well, Jesus and the disciples, and the, as they quoted scripture, there is no hint even in any of the places suggesting that uh, we're not sure these things are real, you know, or you know, maybe it happened. None of that kind of stuff. We have several verses that deal with that. Jim? Matthew five twelve. Be happy and glad, for a great reward is kept for you in heaven. This is how the prophets who lived before you, who before you were persecuted. Good news Bible. Both of these good news. And another one in Matthew thirteen fifty seven. And so they rejected him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is respected everywhere except in his hometown and by his own family. That's quite a comment, even yeah. by his own family. Yeah. Well, that's clear. I mean, this is, this is a statement in Matthew 13. It's even clearer in John 1. He just says, Jesus came down from heaven to his own family, and his own right. family rejected him. Yeah. Just like that. Amazing. Gordon? A couple more from Good News Bible. This is Matthew 23, 34 to 36. And so I tell you that I will send you prophets and wise men and teachers. You will kill some of them, crucify others, and whip others in the synagogues and chase them from, <coughs> excuse me, from town to town. As a result, the punishment for the murder of all innocent people will fall on you, from the murder of innocent Abel to the murder of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you indeed, the punishment for all these murders will fall on the people of this day. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Um, there's, there's a, a possibility. There. What? There's a mistake there, isn't there? There's a mistake there. It's hard to know whether this is Matthew made the mistake or possibly one of the very early copiers made this mistake, but the point is, it's in all the ancient do oldest documents that we have. The Zechariah was killed who was killed between the porch and the altar was not the Zechariah who was the son of Berechiah. Uh, so, are there mistakes in the Bible? Yeah, there are. Whether, I mean, whether they were done by original by Matthew or by somebody else, this isn't the only place where Matthew does something simple like that. Well, you could go back up in Matthew 23, starting at verse 13 yeah. and following, Seven times Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Yeah. Now, who might have been responsible for the 
that error that, that we, you pointed out. Yeah. So, you know, it's human which, beings. Which hypocrite? <laughs> yeah. Or which scribe is um, probably more. Okay. That scribe, we've been dealing with those. You've got translators all, all in that uh, group together. Okay. Go ahead, Gordon. Ma uh, Mark 6, 4. Jesus said to them, prophets are, are respected everywhere except in their own hometown and by their relatives and their family. Wow. If Jesus referred to the Old Testament events as historically accurate and reliable, what could possibly have caused so many modern professedly Christian believers in our day to doubt, doubt them? One might possibly get the idea that while Jesus referred to these things from the Old Testament and spoke of them as authoritative, perhaps his disciples and apostles did not. Nothing could be further from the truth. So now we've talked about Jesus quite a bit. What about the apostles? On Acts 4, 24 to 26, when the believers heard it, they all joined together in prayer to God, Master and Creator of heaven, earth and sea, and all that in them, that is in them. By the means of the Holy Spirit, you spoke through our ancestor David, your servant, when he said, Why were the Gentiles furious? Why did people make their useless plots? The kings of the earth prepared themselves, and the rulers met together against the Lord and his Messiah. Wow. The Good News Bible. Okay, and Acts 13. Paul, Paul said, And we are here to bring the good news to you, what God promised our ancestors he would do. He has now done for us who are their descendants by raising Jesus to life, as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have become your father. And this is what God said about raising him from, the, from death, never to rot away in the grave. I will give you the sacred and sure blessings that I promised to David. As indeed he says in another passage, you will not allow your faithful servant to rot in the grave. For David served God's purpose in his own time, and then he died, was buried with his ancestors, and his body rotted in the grave. Good news, Bible. Okay. <coughs> now, if you don't know the whole story behind that passage, it might be a little confusing. Um, what do you think about Jesus talking about rotting in the grave? Does that sound nice? Is that Peter? Huh? No, it's, oh, it's Paul. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's Paul here, I'm sorry. Uh, what's he what's he talking about here you know the Jews believed that at day four the things really start to deteriorate you remember what Martha said about Lazarus yeah. about Lazarus and so forth like this okay. so the idea here is this Messiah how long was he in the grave not long enough to start rotting so so what is, what's happening here? Is he, these are the words that David said, but guess who fulfills those words? Jesus. 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 So he waited on the fourth day with his friend Lazarus, right? Mm -hmm. He stinks. He stinks. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Do you have Romans 9, 17, Carrie? Oh. Yes. For the scripture says to the king of Egypt, I made you king in order to use you to show my power and to spread my fame over the whole world. Wow. It's from the Good News Bible. Okay, these passages suggest that God is the creator and the words spoken to David are referred to as God's words. In Acts 13, 32 to 36, Paul made the same suggestion. We just looked at it. Dennis? Yes, and this is from the Adult uh, uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, April 16. In fact, the New Testament writers uniformly rely on the Old Testament as the Word of God. There are hundreds of quotes in the New Testament from the Old Testament. One scholar has compiled a list of 2,688 specific references. 400 from Isaiah, 370 from the Psalms, 220 from Exodus, and so on. Yeah, and I interrupt for just a second. Uh, there's one person who says there are 600 references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. So, yeah, amazing. Go ahead. 
If one were to add to this list allusions, themes, and mot motifs, the number would greatly increase. Mm -hmm. The books are replete with references to the Old Testament prophecies that are often introduced with the phrase, it is written, and um, if you have our handouts, you can see the whole list of them there. All of this confirms that the Old Testament scriptures are the foundation upon which the teachings of Jesus and the apostles rest. Yep, repeatedly, it is written, it is written, it is written. Should we even dare to challenge the truthfulness of, of or the reliability of stories from the Old Testament, if this was the way Jesus and the apostles spoke of them? And one interesting example of that that I'm surprised that they didn't mention, but maybe they didn't because we just finished studying the book of Daniel. Remember what Jesus said about the prophecy of Daniel? Let the hearer. It was still future in his day. Mm -hmm. Wait for what is the abomination of desolation will happen. Mm -hmm. Still future. So it wasn't... Antiochus, huh? No, it was not Antiochus. Jackie? This is from Signs of the Times by Ellen G. White. Men consider themselves wiser than the Word of God, wiser even than God, and instead of planting their feet on the immovable foundation and bringing everything to the test of God's Word, they test that Word by their own ideas of science and nature and if it seems not to agree with their scientific ideas, it is discarded as unworthy of credence. Let's think about that for a second. Does this mean that if you believe in science, you have to reject Scripture? No. How do you fit those two together? Well, you have to have a, a feedback cycle mm -hmm. of where you... You, you, you look at one and you look at the other and you go back and forth. If mm -hmm. you just, um, there are people who have scientific ideas that, uh, that are just natural, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, like, and, and our mind tends to run towards natural. Uh, like with Nicodemus, Jesus said, you must be born again. And his mind went to the natural mm -hmm. explanation. How can a man go back into his mother's womb and mm -hmm. be born again? But we do that in so many ways. We we just assume that it's going to, uh, there, there's some explanation for It'll this. It'll be a very literal. Right. So, yeah. uh, so uh, we, we have to test uh, things. Uh, with the uh, with the word, I I happen to but believe. not lean not yeah. not lean to our own understanding uh, either because we can we can misunderstand what we're seeing in Scripture. I believe that we as Seventh Day Adventists, with our understanding of the Great Controversy, have the best opportunity. In fact, maybe exclusively the opportunity to be able to explain everything that has happened down through history in the context of the Great Controversy. Without that, there's a lot of things that are really hard to explain. Yeah. So I, I think we are just enormously blessed to understand. If we have a correct understanding of the great controversy, wow. Okay? And this next quote is Fundamentals of Christian Education, Ellen G. White. Those who become best acquainted with the wisdom and purpose of God as revealed in His Word become men and women of mental strength, and they may become efficient workers with the great educator, Jesus Christ. Christ has given his people the words of truth, and all are called to act a part in making them known to the world. There is no sanctification aside from the truth, the word. Then how essential that it should be understood by everyone. I, I go running early in the morning. I get up when it's still dark, run with a flashlight, because that's the only time of the day when I really have some sort of free time. And I listen to a lot of the writings of Ellen White and the Bible different times as I'm running. This week I heard something that I've seen in other places before in the writings of Ellen White, saying that if young people would study the Bible and really 
dig in the Bible and learn it, you know, understand what's going on there and, and, and discover, discuss the dif different issues. And I would have added, and she probably would have added, understand how it all fits with the great controversy. They would do better even in their studies. He's talking about people who are medical students. Yeah. Amazing. Um, is that possible explanation, at least partially, for what happened with Daniel and his friends? Could be. Could be. Okay. All right. Uh, this is taken from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide from Friday, April 17. Just to give people an idea of where many modern biblical scholars have gone with their skeptic skepticism, here are a few things that many modern scholars deny. They reject a literal six-day creation. Okay, let's stop for a second. Why is that rejected? We don't need to spend a long time, but let's just think. I mean, I think we need to look at both sides of this thing. Clearly, I mean, if you read scripture and that's the only background you have, there really wouldn't be any question. Six days, Lord created everything. Some say if you can't reproduce it in the laboratory, it didn't happen. Exactly. So a one-time thing like creation until God does it some more times in the future, mm -hmm. it, it couldn't have happened, they say. Uh, it's not real reasonable in our day and age for scholars to say that something could come into existence by a word just spoken by God. Yeah. See, it's not reasonable, logical. But they get close to that with the, the singularity, in other words, the, the Big Bang, the, the idea of the Big Bang thing. So I think a lot of what sways people is science scientists use their data to tell stories mm -hmm. about how things happened over millions and billions of years, and this happened this way, and then you hear all these stories that they tell. With a little bit of data, with some data thrown in, and, and uh, for those of you who would who are interested in that sort of thing, like I always am, uh, I have a book that I'm reading now called Darwin Devolved, not Devolved. De yeah, not evolved, but devolved, um, and it just takes Darwin's thinking apart piece by piece. It's amazing, and so. Uh, Lots of challenges to that. Okay, six DA creation. Sorry, okay, yeah, sorry, Margaret. That's okay. Since, since since you're talking about literal here, I would just want to inject another thing. People will say, "Oh, you're a literalist," mm -hmm. um, and because I say that there's six literal days, whereas they would say, "Well, those are figurative days." Mm -hmm. Those same people will turn around and say. Uh, things that I think are figurative, like the dome of the sky, the four corners of the earth, and things like that, are, interpret those as literal. See, they actually believe there was a metal dome over their heads with these holes in it. You know, so, and, I, and I've on, heard it, it's on pillars too. The earth is on pillars. Well, I've I've heard somebody on this campus say it that way. You know, uh, and so they're they're ju they're being literalists too. They're just Turning the you know the literal and figurative on its head, mm -hmm. uh, it, all language is literal and figurative. You have to just figure yeah. out which is which. Yeah. Okay, so anyway. I interrupt you in the middle of your sentence. Sorry, Go okay. ahead. <laughs> anyway, they reject a little literal six-day creation. They accepting billions of years of evolution instead. They reject a sinless Adam in an unfallen unfallen world. They reject a universal worldwide flood. Now we need to talk, talk, stop on that one for a second. How much evidence is there for a flood? Everywhere. All over the place. All over the place. And yet, anyway. And then some reject the literal existence of Abraham. Some reject the story of the Exodus. Some reject the miracles of Jesus, including even his bodily resurrection. Some reject the idea of predictive prophecy in which prophets tell the future, sometimes centuries or even millennia in advance. What should these conclusions tell us about what happens when people start doubting the authority and the authenticity of the scripture? Mm 
Also, what are the ways to try to help such people come to a clear understanding of the truth? Boy, that's a challenge. Well, they don't have ears to hear because they're steeped in naturalism. The Bible, all of it, we would say is a record of God's interaction with the human race. Everything that God has done is instructive, even if it may not have direct application to our lives today. The Protestant Reformation took as its rallying cry, back to the sources. They, of course, were talking about going back to the scriptures. Here we have another very reliable and very important group who based their teachings on sola scriptura, or the scriptures alone. They referred back to Jesus Christ, and we must do the same. And I, I'm reminded that in translating the uh, Romans, chapter 1, Martin Luther, translating into German, said, we are saved by faith alone. He had to add that word, not in the Greek, he had to add it. In 1521, Martin Luther was summoned by the Roman Emperor to Worms in Germany, where he awaited trial by the council. It was a turning point for the Reformation. Was Luther going to recant and repudiate his writings that had stirred all of Europe? Or would he uphold solo, sola scriptura, the Bible alone, as his standard? Luther stood before the emperor and the highest civil and ecclesiastical authorities, an etching from the artist Lucas Cranach that same year presents the clear-cut profile of Luther projecting strength and determination. When the moment came, he spoke in a straightforward manner and with honesty. Quote, Inasmuch as your majesty and your highnesses ask for a plain answer, I shall give one. Unless I am proved to be wrong by the testimony of scriptures and by evident reasoning, for I cannot trust the decisions of either popes or councils. Yeah, let me interrupt there for a second. I mean, he in his books, he showed so many times when they were in conflict with each other. So, you know, you people are trying to judge me here and you, you can't even agree among yourselves. Yeah. What kind of judges are you? Anyway, I'm sorry, go ahead. I cannot trust the decisions of either popes or councils, since it is plain that they have frequently erred and contradicted one another. I am bound in conscience and held fast in the word of God by those passages of the Holy Scriptures which I have quoted. Therefore, I cannot and will not retract anything, for it is neither safe nor salutary to act against one's conscience. Amen. God help me. Amen. <clears throat> the book about Martin Luther by Heinrich Bulmer. Very good. <clears throat> published 1957. So, what was Martin Luther saying? I'm going to follow the example of Jesus, right? I'm going and to follow scripture. I'm yeah. going to follow scripture. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the teachings of men no matter how authoritative they might have claimed to be. We recognize that those temptations of Jesus in the wilderness were absolutely critical to the plan of salvation. So how did Jesus respond to each temptation? Just as we go back and look at those. It is written. In his response to the first temptation listed, Jesus quoted a passage from Deuteronomy 8. And from the adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. I'm, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Do you think God, uh, with his no foreknowledge, gave these words to Moses because he knew someday Jesus would want to use them? Jesus himself knew that someday he would want to use them in quoting? I think he gave them because they were true. Yeah. Um, and uh, whether the, there was a plan to use it that way or it was just always there and Jesus just pulled it up because it had been said before. Jesus knew the scripture so well that there were so many situations that applied, that he could use scripture to apply directly to that situation, and he used it appropriately. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
The context of this passage is God's sustaining providence to ancient Israel when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. God humbled them and sustained them so that they would rely wholly on him. By quoting the scripture, Jesus is saying, my father who has sustained Israel for 40 years will sustain me. I trust in his word alone because I know that he is not only the source of sustenance, but the source of life itself. So think about that. Here's Jesus facing the devil. He knows who he's facing. He knows who the source of life is. Why should I listen to you? I know, I know the source of all this power. There's nothing you, there is nothing you can do to me unless my father permits it. Yeah. I mean, what if we had that kind of a clear, firm relationship to God? That would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Continuing, there is also a deeper implication here. Jesus is submitting himself to the Father just as ancient Israel was taught to submit to the word of God. Jesus speaks not of his own authority, but from the authority of Scripture as spoken by Moses. The argument in Deuteronomy is that because God sustained Israel and preserved them as his people to enter the promised land, they shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to, wa to walk in his ways and to fear him. Very good. Okay, from Desire of Ages. Jesus met Satan with the words of Scripture. It is written, he said, in every temptation, the weapon of his warfare was the word of God. Satan demanded of Christ a miracle as a sign of his divinity. But that which is greater than all miracles, a firm reliance upon a th thus saith the Lord, was a sign that could not be controverted. So long as Christ held to this, pos this position, the tempter could gain no advantage. Hmm. Is our page there, 120. Wow. So, again, Jesus just, I mean, hmm. clearly he had that relationship with his father, which Ellen White says we could have if we had the same kind of whatever. And... We know from historical records that young people in the old days, they spent almost their entire education learning Scripture and memorizing large portions of it. Do you think Jesus memorized the entire Old Testament? I'm sure. Do you think Paul did? He didn't. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Paul did. But Jesus never went to any of the schools. Well, there have been times in history yeah, when but people... He did. he did go to the synagogue and... They read it fairly, uh, you know, I, learned, I think, fairly long passages. And he learned at his mother's knee yeah. as well. Do you suppose Mary could read? I'm sure she could read. I'm sure. When they were in, in Egypt, when he was an infant, it's probably likely that they were in Alexandria because mm -hmm. there was a large Jewish community there. And with the gold incense and myrrh, they could have purchased a, a, skull, a scroll, perhaps, of their own. Easily. So, yeah. they may have had... Uh, that would only be uh, one book of the Bible, though. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure that they, somehow or other, they had access to significant portions of Scripture. If they were in Alexandria, they probably actually had the Septuagint. Yeah. Because that was done before Christ's day. Yes. Translation of the Hebrew Scripture. Mm -hmm. There have been times in history when people have been severely disappointed in the way things worked out. The disciples were shocked and disappointed when Jesus was crucified instead of being proclaimed king. We know that you could have, you could have made yourself king. Just think about it. <laughs> the early Adventist believers were severely disappointed on October 23, 1844, when they woke up to discover that they were not in heaven but still on this earth. Later, a careful study of Scripture led them to see that their interpretation was the problem and not Scripture itself. So what do you suppose Jesus said to those two devout followers who are walking on the road to Emmaus? I mean, I would love to just have the set of quotes that he used. That must have been quite a Bible study. Wow. 
The words burned in their hearts. Yep. Yeah. And I'm sure they never forgot. When they got back to Jerusalem, don't you suspect that they reported those passages from Scripture to the disciples in the upper room? I am sure. Is it Jesus also appeared to them yeah. and, and mm -hmm. did the same thing to the rest yeah. of the disciples. Is it possible that the basic outline that Jesus gave them became a, kind, became a kind of template for sermons that the disciples and the apostles preached right through the first century? Yeah. I think there's a very, very good chance that the, many of those same verses were used by Peter and Paul and John and others right through the New yeah. Testament. And maybe even the same sequence, the logical sequence of because of this, then this, then this, then that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in the 1990s, here in the United States, a movement swept through our country in which young people wore plastic bracelets on their arms or wrists with the letters WWJD. I can remember those times. Yeah. What would Jesus do? I wasn't a teenager in those days, but I do remember them. What would Jesus do? Wouldn't it have been wonderful if many young people had followed through with that question in every aspect of their lives? How would they know what Jesus would have done unless they got it from Scripture? Good question. That's the only way. Yeah. I, mean, I, can, I can say what Jesus would do, but unless it's from Scripture, it's just my imagination. Mm -hmm. Just your interpretation of what you think is said there. Yeah. Famous book, too, that uh, kind of lives by that. I forget who the author was, but the book is called In His Steps. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting book. Yeah. The community that decides to ask that question before they make any decisions. Well, in, in light of that suggestion, what would Jesus do? Should we be promoting uh, maybe the wearing of, I don't know, plastic things or whatever? But anyway, the idea that we would say, what would Jesus say? Would that be appropriate? Can you think of times in your own life when quoting a passage of Scripture or recalling a story from the Bible provided an excellent response to temptation? And you don't even have to quote it out loud. I mean, you can think of times when you might have been tempted to do something and it just pops in your head. Oh, what about that idea? What about here's what Scripture says, here's what the Bible says. No, I'm not going to do that. You know, I have a different idea. So we're going to challenge you with that as we finish. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom from your holy book. From beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, we believe that each word was inspired by the Holy Spirit and was written for our edification. May we make use of it more than we have in the past is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.